So this presentation is entitled Tendrils, Tendrils of Trade. And what I've been looking at and, and am uh, presently working to document uh, are a series of navigational infrastructures and things associated with those throughout some of Virginia's rivers. Um, as we all know, Virginia, like many states, is riddled uh, with waterways. Uh, Virginia in particular actually has some very wide reaches concerning where a raindrop falls and where it may end up. Um, and so we have uh, in the state about 1.472 million acres of, uh, of tidally influenced submerged lands, uh, and that's according to the Virginia Marine Resources Commission. And, and actually, according to the USGS, we have about 2.1 million acres of water covered land. I don't know exactly how they define that, but that means of almost 8% of the state is uh, at some point or mostly underwater. So that's a pretty, uh, pretty decent figure. And that means that there's a lot of archeology span uh, beneath that, adjacent to it, or partially submerged at, at various times. Um, our waterways contribute to some major watersheds and are part of some major watersheds. And that's quite important as we'll see throughout this presentation for connecting historically and pre, during the pre-contact period, our region uh, with many others, uh, going all the way to the Gulf of Mexico, to the Southeastern Atlantic seaboard and well into the Northeast. Um, what I'm focusing on here particularly are rivers, navigable waterways, streams and creeks even, uh, mostly above the fall line, but also some areas uh, that are kind of tributaries of the major rivers below the fall lines. Because as we well know, in Eastern Virginia, what we might call a creek might be as wide as some of our Western rivers or wider than some of our Western rivers. And according to the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources, there are about 35 rivers in Virginia. And here's a map of, uh, of those major ones. Looking at Virginia's geology, um, we, we always know that what's in the ground is not just culture, but uh, things that influence culture like geology. And if you look at the eastern portion of the map here, uh, what, what I think we see is really a large harbor, which is the Chesapeake Bay, well, of course, an outlet to the Atlantic Ocean, uh, with all of these little pathways that lead deep into the state from the east and actually come into the state from the west uh, from Ohio Ribu River tributaries. And they connect to various regions, physiographic regions, which are defined, such as the Shenandoah Valley, um, by having uh, large amounts of arable soil, they would become you know, the breadbasket of Virginia, the iron industry, uh, the tobacco industry uh, throughout the Eastern portion of the state. So these are certainly things that heavily influence settlement patterns uh, and then uh, the archeology. span uh, So we'll start off by saying, why are these inland waterways important? Um, they're major sources of occupation. Uh, people naturally go to the water. They're, uh, they're primary viaducts of transportation, communication. Um, they are literally the earliest highways that we have. And so things that align along our highways now, you know, are important parts of commerce and trade. The same, the same has been true and largely still is true. If you go down the Eastern branch of the Elizabeth River or Western branch, uh, portions of the lower Appomattox, the James, uh, you find certainly lots of, of hubs of commerce there still. And, uh, and Virginia is, of course, harbor to, not harbor to, but home to, one of the largest uh, natural harbors and naval bases in, in the world. Um, the riverine infrastructure within the state also uh, relatively early on in our history as, uh, as a nation forms uh, what you might call public-private partnership with these navigation companies uh, and there were lo lots of them. Yeah, there was a Quantico Canal, but basically these are efforts to canalize existing waterways, and in some cases dig, exist, uh, dig wa waterways adjacent to, or canals next to adjacent, adjacent to rivers, uh, such as the James River and Kanawha Canal. But the point was really to stimulate growth of the new nation. Um, and a government's job, one of the government's jobs is to stimulate growth and uh, during the 1790s, however, we had a large war debt to pay off and we needed to collect taxes in order to pay off that war debt. And so we needed to stimulate growth and many of uh, the early uh, thought processes were to, uh, to you know, get the industry stood up so we can tax it and pay off the war debt and get on our feet as a nation. Some considerations I have about inland waterways here are, you know, they engage us in lots of ways. Um, getting away from just the commerce perspective, um, 
rivers really are representative. Certainly Richmond um, has a very strong connection to the James River, the fall line. It's a very unique portion of the James right there that's ca kind of captured in Richmond. And of course, Richmond's there for partially that reason is to, you know, to, to bridge above that seven mile granite um, shelf that sticks up into the river. And, you know, some maybe more negative connotations that rivers can imbue is when we mistreat them uh, and pollute them. You know, uh, years ago, decades ago, the, the poor Cuyahoga uh, in Cleveland uh, were, were linked uh, as a bad example of what can happen to a river. Fortunately, that has turned around uh, in many senses. Rivers are metaphorical for us. You know, they, they show up in our poetry, um, in, in many forms of art. Uh, and they exemplify the human water interconnection, you know, the, the flowing out to the sea. They provide everything that the ocean is made of uh, is washed out of land by streams and rivers. Uh, that all starts with a raindrop. So going into my role as an archaeologist, our role as archaeologists, um, I hate to say, but many times uh, waterways are kind of written off. Uh, I mean, they're, they're certainly mentioned, but uh, often as ancillary components of uh, larger settlement patterns, they're, they're part of, but the resources that are on them, straddle them, beneath them, uh, are not given kind of the, the, the due shrift uh, that they should. Uh, and part of that is they're hard, they can be hard to work within. Um, certainly there's been many cases where, you know, we've gone out into the field in Florida or here in Virginia, and you just can't get done what you hope to do uh, because of nature. Uh, but at the same time, they are repositories of some amazing archaeological resources. And there are lots of cases throughout the United States, throughout the world, where we've been able to encounter intact archaeological resources that you can't find in land because you don't have the same anaerobic conditions or you don't have the same sort of challenges that actually protect a resource. And so where you may not be able to find that on a terrestrial site, it is thereby preserved in a, uh, an underwater maritime site. Uh, with the, in the case of the storm wreck, shipwreck offshore, you know, we were able to find organic remains that you would only dream of finding in a, in a terrestrial site. And that's, those were buried in, in ocean sediments. Um, let's see, you're moving on. An example of some of that dynamism uh, that rivers can, op, uh, can provide us, here's a screenshot from the USGS Matoix gauge, I believe it is, yep. And this was during a period of field work um, that I completed last year. And you can see those, those, the blue line going up and down, looking kind of like a heartbeat. Um, those were pulses of near flooding conditions. Um, and so I had to work in the river at the bottom of each of those uh, sine waves. And you can see it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger throughout February. And we have actually experienced uh, just more higher water this year. It's been very challenging to get out uh, and be in the field. We're trying to get out in the Pamunkey right now and things are just starting to subside uh, to take a look at a site. Um, so, you know, challenging but not insurmountable. Uh, some other considerations that I, uh, that I have is there appears to be somewhat of a lexicological conundrum uh, of underwater versus maritime. And I think of underwater as basically a situation rather than a context. Uh, it's certainly part of the context. Um, in maritime, although it has typical connotations of being associated with the ocean, uh, if you can see here my example, uh, there is an inland maritime empire everywhere that there is a network of navigable waterways. And so because they connect to the ocean, because they connect to larger uh, maritime infrastructures, I, I don't think that we do ourselves any service by just considering them as underwater. And certainly not all maritime sites are maritime in nature. We may have, and we do have uh, terrestrial sites, uh, you know, from the paleo period, from other periods, uh, or where rivers have shifted course, or where uh, lakes have drowned valleys, and uh, once terrestrial communities. Uh, and those, those are cases where a, a site is underwater, for sure. But I do want to bring that up. I think that is important to discuss periodically. Um, now we'll get into uh, some examples of Virginia's maritime archaeology. I would be remiss in not mentioning uh, some of the major uh, projects that have kind of been very foundational in our region's uh, archaeological research uh, on and by the water. 
Uh, one of them is, uh, is the Betsy Project. And this uh, really began back, well, really back in the 1930s, 20s and 30s. Uh, but this was one of the uh, Yorktown shipwrecks, one of the block, blocking fleet that were sunk uh, by the British to keep um, uh, approaching forces uh, away from Cornwallis's forces there. And here in the lower left-hand portion of the screen is an artist rendition of uh, the former collier Betsy being intentionally sunk to, uh, to guard the British forces. That shipwreck um, in that, that area was very, it was part of some of the earliest um, really recognition of maritime resources uh, below the water. And in the 1980s, uh, Dr. John Broadwater uh, led a very substantive excavation that was actually coffer dammed um, to create a stilling basin where the water could be clarified and excavations uh, went on for eight or nine years uh, to really discover some amazing uh, maritime uh, archaeology here in the Commonwealth. Other projects uh, include the canal boat excavations in Richmond, at Maimon, in the Great Turning Basin, uh, of course the Alexandria ships that are still being discovered, um, Chickahominy Naval Yard, a uh, very early uh, important part of our, our revolutionary history, uh, the log boat inventory that's being completed by colleagues of mine in the Archaeological Society of Virginia Maritime Heritage Chapter, a uh, project in which I was a part, the Nanceman Ghost Fleet down in Suffolk, uh, which we completed last year. Uh, the Esk Project over on the Eastern Shore on Paramore Island, and there are many others. I mean, there's lots of survey that's gone on throughout the Chesapeake Bay um, in the contract side of things that has compiled uh, some of the great literature on Virginia's maritime archaeology. However, um, we'll move back uh, mostly inland uh, to the Appomattox River Pilot Study or the ARPS Project, uh, and I'll run you through it's going to seem somewat quick for me because uh, it's fascinating to me um, and I hope it is to you as well. And many of the things that I've mentioned, uh, I'm going to assume that these are things that you know about, you have appreciated, uh, but may have, you know, because we all have a lot to do um, and think about, gotten pushed back to the recesses of our mind. But I do want to remind us all of the importance of the inland maritime uh, structure in Virginia. So I selected in 2020 and early 2020, actually late 2019, um, a portion of the Appomattox River highlighted here in red uh, to survey. And that it also included a portion of Flat Creek, uh, which goes into, it's a tributary of the Appomattox and it goes into Eastern and the middle of Amelia County and was, uh, was a navigable waterway. You can see the Appomattox here uh, shown in the Fry Jefferson map and Flat Creek is denoted there. The old courthouse was near it. So I selected this area because it has uh, a fair amount of early documentation, including Benjamin Latrobe in the 1790s, uh, was commissioned to uh, do a little survey of the river from up near Farmville all the way down to where uh, Petersburg is and into the mouth of the Appomattox. This is one of the, this is the first illustration that we have that I'm aware of, of the upper Appomattox. It kind of looks like that, but he did some very nice paintings and imagery that are still uh, still used uh, throughout today's scholarship. And what I was looking at uh, in particular was what's illustrated here by uh, a chap named by the name of Cowdy. He was an engineer for the, Appoma the upper Appomattox company, which was charged by the legislature with putting in a number of navigational improvements to opened the river up to South Central Virginia, which of course by the 1790s and around 1800 was a very important tobacco growing region. Uh, but there were also timber reserves that were coming out. And so because of that company, uh, they, they begin to create reams of paperwork. They had to report to the, the Board of Public Navigations annually. Uh, many of those uh, reports still exist. And of course, a number of maps still exist. And you can see here, uh, there are a number of locks and dam structures. There were uh, mills along the river. And uh, we, we begin to see because of these public works projects, challenges in courts, uh, two blockages in the river. Uh, one uh, poor gentleman whose land was flooded along the Appomattox River fought the company for about nine years and ended up going to the Virginia Supreme Court to be remunerated for the, his lands that were flooded uh, by the company. Here's what the Appomattox River looks like uh, today. 
And uh, it's a really shallow river, like many of Virginia's rivers. Uh, it's beautiful. It's very remote for most of its uh, run, uh, which is, if memory serves, about 137 linear uh, miles of river. Uh, but this connected to some very vibrant uh, areas of trade uh, in the early 19th century. And in order to make a shallow, narrow, narrow river like that navigable, uh, at various places, wing dams had to be constructed, um, which kind of back up a shallow pool of water, but it's just deep enough to get a bateau uh, through. And of course, these all served basically down to Petersburg, which was a transshipment point where ocean going vessels could come up to City Point and up as far as Petersburg uh, to receive cargoes of things coming down the river, and also very importantly, to unload cargoes of things uh, to ship upriver, such as salt and goods. One of the most taxed uh, goods that the Appomattox Company thrived off of were general dry goods. So everything from furniture to probably pianos uh, that would be transported up on bateaus and, uh, and would pay taxes to go through the locks. Uh, during the project, I even looked at some of the uh, narrow creekways here because of their constant cutting in all of the floods we had last year that actually uh, cut right through some archaeological uh, contexts, uh, which I was able to document in the bank without having to get out and do any uh, excavations. Here's what Flat Creek looked like at the time. Um, I felt somewhat connected to the early uh, designers of the navigation works here because uh, not very far up the creek and down the creek, I was stopped by fallen timber. Uh, and probably the largest job that the Appomattox Company had to do, along with other navigational companies, was to clear fallen trees. We just had a big ice storm, two ice storms over the past couple, well, past three weeks. And certainly thinking back 200 years, folks would have been out there in the cold water, uh, clearing out these, these channels with all the fallen trees that have just come down. So that presented some challenges uh, archeologically to actually being able to ex access uh, sites and being able to see things on the ground. Um, so what I'd set out to do here, as you can see, was inventory cultural resources along the river, and working with the Department of Historic Resources and their VCRIS database to identify previously recorded sites for site revisit, uh, and then to inventory new sites that had not been yet recorded. Um, Sites that are adjacent to waterways or contained within waterways um, often are more imperiled by the change, the natural change and changes, uh, transitions of waterways. Um, and so in Florida, we worked with the Florida Public Archaeology Network uh, vigorously to look at and redocument uh, bank line sites and submerged sites uh, to see how those are changing because lots of them are, are being eroded away. Um, as shorelines shift down there pretty dramatically, increased numbers of storms, intensity of storms uh, is causing the loss of a lot of archaeology down there. And so I thought, well, can we expand this model up here and establish a baseline using existing knowledge and collecting additional uh, to be able to, to monitor these areas and see what we have and what we've lost and what we are potentially losing. Um, one of the best ways I've found, of course, is to do this was to go back to um, to go back into the archives uh, to see what documentations we had, what documentation we have, but also to look at LIDAR surveys. So at the bottom of the screen here, that ended up being one of the most important tools that I was able to bring to bear because um, this kayak could get me up and down the rivers and the streams, but where trees weren't uh, blocking the way, but getting onto land Although sometimes possible, I ended up getting permission to uh, for about 6,000 acres of timberland and farmland uh, to be able to get out and, and survey the bank line, but certainly not everywhere. I uh, ended up looking at, gosh, I want to say something like 18 square miles of, uh, of areas surrounding the Appomattox and Flat Creek. And LIDAR was able, uh, it really enabled me to see features that extended from the river. You can see a, a piece of wing dam here. Here's Lily this past summer, the river did not look like that when I was doing the, uh, the survey last winter. It was a bit muddier. Um, so summer's obviously a nicer time to do that. Brings its own challenges too. Uh, let's skip that one. So before we got into LIDAR, uh, it was a basic riverine survey. And you can see here, I've got in my lap on the boat, um, a very powerful tool. And I'll talk about these later. 
but uh, the Atlas series that has been produced by Bill Trout and the Virginia Canals and Navigation Society. Uh, because in there are compiled a number of archeological sites previously recorded that I was able to go back and revisit. So that was kind of my roadmap. And some of those sites, I'll, I'll touch on a few of those, include the Clementown Mill. Uh, that site was started uh, in the uh, middle of the 18th century. Uh, it was one of the larger mills along the Appomattox River. It survived, uh, like many mills, into the 20th century. You can see it here in the 1920s or 30s in the background of a picture of some people swimming in the river. Um, but it quickly uh, fell apart during the 20th century. Floods knocked it over, undermined the foundation. But this is what's left, and it's, it's not insubstantial. Um, but I will say that since I was, since witnessing or visiting this site back in high school, uh, a lot more of it has disappeared. A lot more of the dam that's there has disappeared, the mill structure. And to my knowledge, this is the most intact mill, lock, and dam structure on the Appomattox River. And so therein lies uh, part of its value. Uh, there's, and who knows what's actually contained within the sediments of the river uh, that date to the mill. Uh, the lock structure is, let's see here on the left-hand side, and then the mill race, at least the latter uh, mill race would have been, or the latest mill race would have been on the right-hand side. Uh, quite an impressive uh, infrastructure still left and often completely overtopped by flooding. And this is a picture from downstream looking up. In the right-hand section of the picture, you can see uh, the what's left of the dam, which is, as I mentioned, that's the, the most intact uh, dam structure uh, left on the river, uh, at least above uh, Petersburg. Tucker's Ford Lock and Dam, another site here. This was a previously recorded site by uh, Bill Trout. Um, and this is probably uh, one of the more intact lock structures, although it's infilled largely inside the lock by earth that's uh, just sedimented it in uh, as the land is going back to its state of repose. Um, let's see here, I have a picture of that from downstream. So here is what it looks like. So I didn't have permission to get out of the boat on this piece of property. I since have actually gotten that, but at the time I couldn't get out without trespassing, but LIDAR allows me to visually access what I was looking at. And so that kind of batch shaped uh, polygon there encompasses what the reason it uh, goes across the river is you can actually see the road coming down to the river from both sides, the old Ford, and then the lock structure uh, is highlighted there on the south bank by a kind of a divot uh, carved out in the river. And so from the bank, I couldn't see all of that. I could see the stone structure, but not the whole uh, carving and, and the whole works uh, dug into the side of the bank. So LIDAR available from USGS uh, and run through, um, I'm using QGIS software, which is a freeware, as opposed to using uh, ArcView, which you pay good money for. Good software, but you pay good money for it. Um, QGIS and, and LIDAR analysis allowed me to document these sites uh, and update them uh, to update the record at VCRIS. Another mill, and this was the last standing mill. Notice I used the past tense. This was the last standing mill in Amelia County. Um, it's not on the Appomattox River, but it's on Giles Creek and only within two or 300 feet from the river itself. When I documented this, uh, this is a late 18th century mill uh, around like real late 18th century mill. It has the original mill wheel as far as we know, five stories tall. This is what the uh, complex looked like in the 1960s. And uh, much of that mill is actually below the hillside. Here you can see the full uh, five stories there. Some of these stones are absolutely giant. Uh, I mean, they must be a couple of tons, a couple of three tons a piece. So getting them in, into position must have been quite the, uh, the undertaking. This is what the mill looked like when I first started the survey. And I hate to say, but since then it's collapsed. Um, and uh, inside of it is, is most of its gearing is still in place. The run of stones has been removed and unfortunately sold. But, um, but it was an early interesting composite mill, a lot of iron gearing, wood gearing. Uh, the lantern gear is still intact. The bolting mills are unfortunately in pieces, but they're still in there. Um, so this was worth documenting. Uh, it has, it was part of the, uh, it had been documented in Vicris, but here we see uh, on the inside, these 
photographs and that information has been uploaded uh, to, uh, to up update the record. And there is the mill in the process of collapse. More of it has done, since fallen down. That little sycamore tree is actually holding up uh, the fourth and fifth stories. So we revisited sites, but we also wanted to identify new sites. And some of those were hidden in plain sight, uh, such as Goods Bridge, uh, which is now 44 AM uh, 106. And that is right next to the Route 360 bridge, Patrick Henry Highway, where it crosses the river. And these are 19th century abutments. Uh, this was also, of course, the site of um, a minor Civil War skirmish and a semi-major uh, for the region for Amelia County in the south in Southside Virginia uh, revolutionary action, we'll call it that, uh, where Anthony Wayne, he wasn't a general at the time, uh, but defended uh, the bridge in, I believe, in 1781. I think I have my date wrong on that. Um, but this was not recorded as a site, has since been. Um, one of the most prevalent features that I was able to find, not as much on the Appomattox, but on navigable creeks or creeks large enough to be navigable was diking. And this is, I think, really interesting because it, it not only delineates where real wealth was being put into agricultural pursuits here in, in Virginia, uh, throughout Central Virginia, but these are things that can be found easily with LIDAR. I think the next slide, yes, here we have um, one of the large diking comp or dike complexes that on the upper, upper Flat Creek uh, that I recorded. Uh, and this was part of the Tab family, originally from Gloucester moved, some of them moved to Amelia in the 1740s to continue their mercantile empire. Uh, and also of course expanded into agriculture here. The yellow tendrils there our dikes, and I think here is, yeah. So here's what some of the diking looks like in LIDAR. Uh, I mean, and it really shines, it's easy to see. And so in areas where I didn't have permission to go and survey like I did here and actually record the dikes in person, LIDAR is a very powerful tool to be able to record these large landscape features. You can see here a portion of uh, Flat Creek. This was a, a navigable creek in the 19th century uh, where an older uh, stream bed has now been departed by the river uh, just above the word analysis. Uh, and that area is riddled with sites as well. Giles Bridge there, you can often find where roadways uh, once were. Uh, very apparent here, this is an early 20th century road that has probably overlapped uh, maybe as early as, a, as an early 18th century road. Uh, there are not as many maps of Amelia County as one would hope uh, for there to be. And so uh, going back, uh, LIDAR has really enabled me to compare historic maps with uh, this data to ground truth, what was there according to the maps. The La Prade map here uh, from the 1888 shows uh, Porter's Mill and Mill Pond. Uh, I have never seen this site with my own eyes, only through LIDAR, but overlay of LIDAR onto or sorry, overlay of the map onto LIDAR shows that what is in, highlighted in yellow here is the old Porter's Mill Dam uh, and complex. So another way to kind of reach out and grab uh, archeological resources without having to, or being able to access them. Something I also uh, came up or not came up with, but identified throughout LIDAR analysis were these little pock marks uh, all over the place. And I think I recorded seven or eight or nine of these along the Appomattox River ground truthing a number of, the, number of them uh, shows them to look like this, which is full of trees, kind of hard to see, but it's an ice pit. Uh, this is at uh, actually an old family uh, property here in Amelia County, but looking at it on LIDAR, uh, this is one of my ground truth sites. It's right adjacent to where this structure stood, as many ice houses are, right near the house. And so the green circle there is the ice pit and the darker red features uh, are the locations of known historic structures uh, dating to the early 19th century. So for predictive modeling purposes, LIDAR is wonderful to be able to find those ice pits where they still exist, having been filled in, uh, and be able to predict where other historic structures were nearby. So uh, we mentioned landscape changes. Uh, LIDAR is a powerful tool for finding where old watercourses were, as you can see here. And 
as a result of this project, which was I think 14 days of field work, um, we were able to, I was able to uh, survey about 35 linear miles of the Appomattox River uh, that, and that's by kayak, not LIDAR, uh, a little under two miles of Flat Creek, uh, just under 30 square miles of LIDAR analysis were completed 18,000 acres, 16 new sites, or sorry, 16 sites revisited, 17 new sites recorded, and then VCRIS has been updated with all of that. So, you know, for a relatively low budget short-term project, I hope that this was uh, something that, uh, that generates the Commonwealth and being able to uh, keep up with what we have had, what we do have, and in some cases, what we've lost. Uh, that's as much of a important, much of, of an important process of archaeology is not just finding the new old, but documenting uh, what's happening to our sites. Um, one of the things I was able to do over the past year that I really enjoyed, partially because of the pandemic, was get out in a very limited and careful way but visit some of the, the uh, navigational sites throughout uh, Virginia uh, to be able to take the atlases and reacquaint myself with the beautiful Commonwealth. Uh, and here is in, in the early summer, I was visiting the site of uh, the Frank Paget water tragedy in 1854 uh, story, which unfortunately uh, leads to the death of, of several people, but the, the packet Clinton what was washed into Balcony Falls and uh, a, a waterman named Frank Paget was able to swim out and help save a number of people before ultimately succumbing himself. But uh, here's a little known marker, uh, you know, kind of hidden in the state to things like that. And uh, not far from there up, let's see, I'm supposed to change slides here, up the Mari River, uh, an exceptionally intact lock structure. There's actually two or three of these along the Mari. And, uh, I encourage you to get out and see these things. Um, number one, it's a beautiful, we're getting into a beautiful time of year to be able to do that. But the inland navigation structure of Virginia really has helped me and I think a lot of people understand how Virginia has historically come to be and how important these little streams that we think of as kind of natural resources were as cultural resources, how they, the connections that they made, the reasons why things are where they are and how they are where they are now. And so I'm hoping to expand the Appomattox River pilot study, hence pilot study into a larger project uh, called, called the Cultural Resources Riparian Inventory Impact Study, uh, which will look at five different areas of the state, starting from the east with a little red dot over on the Eastern shore, looking at uh, not inland navigation, but uh, what you might call a virgin, virgin in, inlet complex uh, to see what is going on in the Eastern shore in some of these very dynamic inlet uh, environments. And then moving inshore to continue work on the Appomattox, uh, work on the Rivanna River in, uh, in Fluvanna County, and then all the way west, you can't see here, but here's a slide of hopefully doing some work on the, uh, the New River over in Grayson County. So, um, Going back to, I told you I'd end on this. Um, I really do want to flog these uh, because they are an exceptional resource, uh, covers almost all of Virginia's rivers. Uh, and you can get these online, uh, strongly advise you. And if you can do some wonderful driving around the state and use these as your roadmaps. And Bill Trout and the Virginia Canal Navigation Society put these together over, it's a work of about 30 years, 40 years um, of dedication. Uh, and here at virginiacanals.org, we'll take you right there. Um, and I also need to talk about the, the uh, Archaeological Society of Virginia Maritime Heritage Chapter. Um, I'm the, the current president of that. If you are interested in maritime heritage in Virginia, uh, maritime archaeology, we, I encourage you to join us, maritimeheritagevirginia.org. And I also encourage you to support preservation. It's so incredibly important. Um, as we all know, over the past couple of years, the pandemic and many other things have influenced uh, national, state, and local budgets. And preservation is often early on the chopping block and late to return. Um, and so it really is our individual responsibilities uh, to support organizations like Gunston Hall that bring us together to share data, uh, to, in, to remind ourselves of the rich history that surrounds us uh, and why it's important to support that. So. 
with that, I want to thank you all for joining uh, me today and uh, and talking about Virginia's inland navigation infrastructure and uh, what how archaeology uh, is involved with that. So uh, thank you so much and thank you, Lacey, for putting this together. I certainly can't take all the credit. Thank you so much to all of our partners at FOFA and Fairfax Archaeology for putting this together as well. Um, particularly thank you to uh, Liz Kroll for uh, recruiting Brendan to chat with us today. So Brendan, you have a ton of questions about LIDAR. <laughs> no surprise. Um, let's start with, um, what is the resolution of the LIDAR? So LIDAR has been around for a while. Um, and I should start with saying LIDAR means light, uh, oh gosh. It's, it, it's a process that involves lasers, usually flown in planes, um, that take billions of points, if not trillions of points of data that compile a 3D network or a mesh, a cloud, um, that can see, if you will, the ground surface. And then uh, in a way that that can be presented electronically as the actual ground minus trees and structure. And that's so important because, you know, where there are woods, we can't often see what's going on with the ground. LIDAR can actually penetrate forests because it actually goes not around, but through holes and branches and around from so many angles uh, and produces a beautiful image. The revolution for LIDAR is really like so many online revolutions that we have now, it's access to data. Uh, this is data that's collected by the USGS, by other municipalities and states. Um, and what I'm using is kind of mid-grade LIDAR. It's one foot resolution uh, for the most part. It's, it's really pretty accurate. I've gone out in ground truth many places. I just found an ice producing complex from the late 18th century and it did not present like it should have. So there's some, it's not perfect, but it's revolution, excuse me, revolutionized many fa uh, faces of archeology, span including, especially in Mesoamerica. We often um, have seen in the newspaper or magazines uh, online about, you know, the Mayan world is being, is emerging from the jungle uh, because of LIDAR. We can't see through and survey all of these, you know, hundreds or thousands of square miles of the Yucatan and those areas. And so LIDAR, uh, you know, from the University of Pennsylvania, you can see into uh, the, the inner sanctum of the Yucatan. Um, and free things like freeware, QGIS, all of that. I don't think, you know, this was a small budget project. And so I can kind of put these free building blocks together to, to better understand the landscape that I'm attempting to uh, investigate and query. So it's a, it's a great thing it, it, because you can change the lighting, basically the aspect of the sun, if you will, in, in LIDAR and the, um, the elevation of the sun, you can kind of make things pop it's called hill shading, but you can make things appear uh, in a similar manner that you might take a flashlight to look at a tombstone to be able to pull out dates or letters that otherwise you can't see. So that's part of the LIDAR revolution, and I'm happy to benefit from it. Well, I'm definitely going to have to go look amazing. Um, we have another question about LIDAR. Will it show where streams and stream banks have been filled? Sometimes. Um, where, so LIDAR analysis is really impinges upon knowing what has happened to a ground surface, surface um, since the time, you know, well, let me back up and say this. So if a stream has moved, and a far, a, you know, farm field hasn't been leveled over top of it, then yes, you can see where a stream bank was. But there's been so much landscape modification, um, you have to understand that and know where landscapes have been modified. Um, one of those types of modifications is plowing. And LIDAR enables us to see plow scars that might be from a field that hadn't been plowed in 175 years. And I've, it was amazing how much how many fields, how many historic fields I was able to delineate. And that's something 
kind of struggle with like, well, these are cultural feature features, like how do we treat these? And so I'm still kind of struggling with that. But um, I know that uh, lots of organizations are using LIDAR to great effect. Uh, Montpelier has a really cool online. Uh, I encourage you all to see that uh, an online exhibit about LIDAR and how they've been able to kind of bring back some of the larger landscape features that shovel test but surveys don't, you know, they don't give us that data. Um, so yes, we can see where some streams were, um, but as a as rivers move back and forth, they also tend to erase some of their previous changes. So not always. One question that we have, um, you've been talking a ton about, about LIDAR, and I think this might connect to that. So let me know. Um, what kind of underwater scanning technology is available for the average archaeologist to utilize to survey a creek or river to find subtle features such as landings, shell middens, and crossings? Um, that's an excellent question and something that I've been grappling with for, uh, for a little over a decade because when I first started working in Florida, I was given a, uh, a large crate that contained a, side, a brand new side scan sonar, which I'd never used. And I was told to open the crate and get to learn the machine. So uh, I did and ended up working with uh, Klein Industries up in New, in New Salem, New Hampshire to, to learn that machine and a few others. And over the years ended up teaching um, remote sensing classes. In fact, I'm, I'm headed back down to Florida this summer to do a two week course. Um, and side scan sonography is fantastic. And it used to be the the, the playing field for basically the rich. And by that, I mean, you know, institutions that have $100,000 to put into a piece of equipment that you dangle on a, a cable out of sight in the water and drag through a hazardous field for it may never, you know, it may never come back. Uh, most of the time they do. But since that day of opening the, the crate with the client in it, you can go on Amazon and for under 2000 bucks, by a hummingbird side imaging sonar, which does, I hate to say 80% of what an $80,000 unit will do. Uh, there are some limitations to that, but that has democratized the ability to gather underwater imagery as much as anything ever. And uh, because side scan sonar technology, the concept of that has been around now, no one actually knows when it first began because it all began in super secret rooms in Navy yards uh, throughout the world to find submarines. But uh, it has since become highly democratized. And for example, the research boat that we were running when I left LAMP, uh, we had built in a Humminbird unit. We worked with Humminbird to develop some new transducers and, and ways of applying those. So when we were cruising out to a site to go work on the site for the day, I would choose a different route every day and scan a different section of the water. And we were finding stuff in our own backyard that we'd never seen before. Uh, and we were doing it at 13 knots, which was a pretty high speed. So that's what, a what pretty fast clip. Yeah. What I hope to use in the next phase of, of field work is to be able to put one of these hummingbird units or something of uh, equivalent technology and integrate that into the kayak and be able, for example, in the New River where there are dams that have uh, drowned areas or flooded areas of the New River drainage, like what's down there? Because often those, those inundations took place before cultural resources surveys were required. Um, so I'm really excited to see what the sonar will see there. So yes, things have changed. You can find shell, you can find all, gosh, all sorts of things. Of course, you know, Maritime archaeologists, we also use sub-bottom profilers to penetrate this, the sediments to be able to see. You can find uh, shell middens, uh, archaic period shell middens in Florida, which we have, uh, that were completely buried in marine sediments. Uh, and then magnetometers are also critically important. But right now I'm focusing on getting uh, more of the side imaging acoustic technology involved in this project. So we've got one more um about uh usgs um have you reached out to the u.s geological survey to see if they have any maps of the areas you have visited um the usgs does have some historic imagery most of it that i'm aware of is 20th century uh and some late stuff um 
a really cool resource that is not applicable to as much the inland work that I've been doing, but coastal work is NOAA maintains a historic, uh, a database of historic charts. Um, some of the old uh, coastal survey maps and charts, and, and some of those go back there, 18th century, um, that they have digitized. And here's the fun part, made available so you can, you can drop them right into Google Earth as a layer. And so if you're doing work on the Eastern shore or wherever, you can open that database up and it will show you all of those historic charts that are available for that area. And they've been geo-referenced by NOAA. Um, I'm not aware of any product that USGS has for that, but if you have information about that, I'd love to know about that. I've been predominantly mining USGS for their LIDAR data. That is, all of this is so amazing, Brendan. You have been doing some amazing work and I'm, I'm curious to learn more. This is really, really fascinating. Um, we have reached the end of our questions. You covered a couple of them um, in answering some others. Um, so why don't we take a quick break?